Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for that warm welcome. And thank you, Ken Collins, for that very much appreciated but probably overstated introduction. I trust you all know what Abraham Lincoln said when he was introduced, words that he appreciated but thought were not quite deserved. Honest Abe said, never take time to deny them. The audience will find out the truth soon enough for themselves. <laughs> and so it will be with you this morning. Beautiful morning in Northern California and Valentine's Day. I want to start by telling you a story. I have so much ground I want to cover with you this morning, but I'm going to start with a story. It was Valentine's Day, February 14th, uh, 1981, when I was named to succeed uh, the late, great Walter Cronkite. Keep in mind that I said succeed. I didn't say replace. Nobody replaces an icon like a Cronkite. But the story I want to tell you is a Valentine's Day story of a sort has, as Dr. Henry Kissinger once said in another context, this story has the added advantage of being true. <laughs> I understand that some other people have adopted it today, but when I was named to succeed Walter Cronkite, the powers that be at the corporate side of CBS took me aside and said, Dan, uh, we know you feel honored by getting this job, as you should, but we feel like we should be candid with you, that whenever you step into succeed someone as iconic as Walter Cronkite, inevitably the audience is going to sort of go away for a while. So you should be prepared for the ratings to go down and for you not to do very well for maybe a year, year and a half, maybe as long as two years. We're confident, they said, that eventually the audience will come back to you. But we, we want to level with you that things are going to go down the, the second you take the broadcast. Well, I worried about that, but I'd already taken the job, so I made my peace with it. Well, as things turned out, it didn't work out that way, having very little to do with me personally, but the ratings not only held, but they even went up for a while, and so things were good. So by a year and a half after I'd taken the job, I came home one night, and my wife, Jean, to whom I've now been married 62 years, but at that time I'd probably been married to her 30 years. Thank you. Nonetheless, my wife, Jean, was there with our then two young children, and they took me aside and said, you know, Dan, Dad, your head has gotten so big you can't get in the door. <laughs> and quite honestly, we can't stand you. I took that to heart, and so we decided to do the following in order for me to sort of come down high off the pedestal, that we'd go home to Texas, both Jean and I or fifth or sixth generation Texans. Both my parents were dead by this time, but Gene's parents were still alive. And they lived in a remote rural section of Texas, Winchester, Texas. If you haven't heard of it, no disgrace. Winchester is a small village of 35 people, 20 of whom are Gene's family. <laughs> but the idea was I would take some time off. We'd go back home to Winchester and I'd sort of get in touch with my roots again and sort of lose this conceit that I had developed. So we flew to Austin and had a rent car. It was one of those sweltering hot Texas days. And to get to Winchester, you take an eight-lane superhighway, federal highway, then a four-lane state superhighway, and eventually you take a black blacktop road that runs to a rock road. The rock road runs to a dirt road. At the end of the dark road is Winchester. Anyway, we drove from the airport to where the blacktop meets the rock road, and there was a new service station combination service station and convenience store that had not been there before. So Gene says, Dan, pull in here. We'll, we'll get some Dr. Pepper for everybody and the kids. And as she got out of the car, she said, uh, keep the motor running. I won't be long. Well, that turned out to be untrue. As she stayed in there five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. She was actually in there 27 minutes. And when she finally got back to the car, I made two mistakes which any of you men who've been married for any length of time will recognize these mistakes instantly. <laughs> the first thing she got in the car, I said some version of, damn, honey, you stayed in there an awful long time uh, to get this four Dr. Peppers. And by the way, I noticed through the plate glass window that you were having an extended conversation with uh, the not-so-young young man who was handling the cash register, she said, oh, Dan, come on, get the car moving, it's nothing. She said, that, that man is Luther Zimmerhansel. 
And I dated Luther Jim Hansel when I was in high school. <laughs> then I made my second mistake. <laughs> so with a bit of a smirk, I said, well, <clears throat> you know, Gene, if things had taken a little bit different turn, you might be out here with old Luther Zimmerhansel helping to run this convenience store and service station. And don't you know that she didn't miss a beat? She said, no, Dan, you don't understand. If I had married Luther Zimmerhansel, he would be the anchor and managing editor of the CBS Evening News. <laughs> True story, and I love to tell it, and in particular I love to tell it today because I am honored to be here. Let's face it, folks, the idea of a reporter at my age and stage being asked to address leaders in Silicon Valley is humbling. Now, I recognize humbling and humble are not words generally associated with present or past television anchor people, but I do feel it today. Remember, I cut my teeth as a professional on manual typewriters. And when I was growing up, a radio the size of a kitchen cabinet was considered cutting-edge technology. So as I prepared for this talk this morning, I wondered what, if any, perspective I might provide to all of you that would possibly be of any interest or even aiming for a higher bar of any possible use. Because you or innovators focused on the future, prototyping ideas and technologies that will shape our world for decades to come. My background is primarily from the past, having worked on datelines and deadlines for over 70 years now. But here we meet in the present. This is a chaotic and uncertain time, a moment of great challenge and risk, but it's also an age of opportunity. And I urge us today not to forget that. The choices we make now will profoundly affect the future at the same time. We're all too aware that we cannot escape our past. Now, to say the present is tied to what preceded it and that it will affect where we go is a truism that holds in some sense for any moment in history. But I have seen a lot of presents, and in my estimation, this present is especially profoundly different. From our national political crisis to the existential threat of climate change to a rapidly changing information and media landscape, we face a series of inflection points that will shape the odds of whether we can survive not only as a secure, just, and sustainable nation, but the question is even, can we survive as a species on our beloved planet? Now, in taking stock of the challenges we face, I humbly submit and gently submit we have to guard against hyperbole. As a young reporter, that was a lesson ruthlessly taught to me by a number of editors. Don't jump to conclusions you cannot support. But we also must not diminish what lies before us and not underestimate the pace of change. I will submit to you, I suspect you have thought of it yourself, that the acceleration of the pace of change is one of the hallmarks of our time. I remember a time when the land where we stand on, this very land, was a relatively sleepy corner of a state known more for its orange groves than its IPOs. Well, you had a pretty good regional university, I'll bet one overshadowed a bit by that other campus, 40 miles or so to your north. It was a time when only diehard chemists had heard of an element called silicon. But over the decades, as the fates of empires waxed and waned, as global populations exploded, as wars came and went, as the political and economic landscape shifted with the power of a California earthquake, this valley, now known the world over as Silicon Valley, has become an epicenter for global change. But you know, I also remember a time, much more recently, and one you probably remember even better than I, when what was happening here 
in Silicon Valley was heralded as an unmitigated good. The future, a technology-driven future, would help solve the world's problems by bringing people together across barriers. Information would be at everyone's fingertips in progress, social progress, economic progress, educational progress, even moral progress would flow forth. These expectations were always unrealistic, a different sort of tech bubble, if you will, a tech optimism bubble. Now, if that bubble had merely popped, that would be one thing, but that's not what happened. We now live in a time where some of the world's biggest problems, the rise of authoritarianism, the denigration of truth and facts, the lack of an open marketplace of ideas, deep polarization, the fanning of ethnic, cultural, and religious hatreds, income inequality, and so many more are all being blamed in many ways on the technology and the ethos of this very valley. Is all of this criticism justified or fair? Of course not. As a reporter, you learn the world is complex, and to be wary of a simple story, storylines, or narratives of just cause and effect. But at the same time, as a reporter, you learn that you have to fight the human biases of all of us, the ones we harbor, to get as close to the truth as is humanly possible. And the truth is that the world has serious problems, and the technology of Silicon Valley has helped to contribute to some of that, and even more importantly, can help also to be a solution. I'd like to focus quickly on three key areas, the flow of information, corporate responsibility, and fostering a climate of hope. Let's start with information, because that's the world to which I have dedicated my life. I've seen the means of communication shift drastically. Radio, television, satellites, cable, the internet, social media, and smartphones, it's all mind-boggling. And I am about as far away from being a so-called digital native as Abraham Lincoln was from being a YouTube star. <laughs> But at the same time, I'd like to think I have embraced at least some of the new media even wading into the worlds of Facebook and Twitter, I'll bet with the help of some much younger colleagues along the way. What I've found in dipping my toe into the current whirlpool of digital media is that technology advances much more quickly than human evolution. Stories are still stories. Communication is still communication. People have needs for information, for community, for laughter and nostalgia, and anger, but we also have a propensity for self-selecting, for skimming headlines, and even for believing conspiracy theories, especially if they confirm our preconceptions. As neuroscientists here in the Bay Area and around the world try to unlock the mysteries of the brain, we have a lot to learn about how we think and why we think what we do. That does not absolve us of the responsibility to act on what we can see before us. The way we share information has elements that are unlocking dreams and talent, but other elements that are spreading dangerous propaganda. It's not enough to say, well, we're just the pipelines. For these pipelines have wreaked havoc on business models that used to drive responsible reporting of quality and integrity. Now, I'm not going to stand here and spin a story that everything was better in the good old days for journalism or anything else. For journalism, they were major problems and blind spots to coverage when those doing the reporting were almost exclusively white and male and when a few networks controlled the airways. But it was also a time of robust local newspapers covering everything from zoning meetings to state capitals. It was a time, not that long ago, when there was money for deep-digging investigative reporting and for first-class international reporting with many foreign bureaus. 
Now, I could spend the rest of this day talking about the news business, and I know you're relieved to hear that I will not. But for the sake of our short time here together today, I want to plead with all of you. We in the journalism business need your help. Trust me, the best reporters I know would be horrible CEOs, especially of a tech company. And yet, that is the world we have all been thrown into. There has to be ways to develop a business model that supports quality journalism and still succeeds in a digital environment. There must be ways where we build communities where quality information is shared and rises to the top of our feeds. I know many of you are working on it and thinking about it. I urge you forward and applaud you and offer whatever help I may be able to give. This leads... Thank you. And I mean that. Now, all of this rather provocal concerns of mine in journalism, this leads to a broader concern on a broad general basis about corporate citizenship. This is, of course, a topic far bigger than Silicon Valley. It encompasses big banks, the petrochemical companies, big pharma, insurance, manufacturing, retail, and indeed all businesses, big and small. For we live in a time where the mantra that drove business for decades, that phrase which so easily rolls off the tongue now, maximizing shareholder value, is being called into deep question. Who should we consider the shareholders? Are they only the stockholders? Well, what about the workers? What about the communities that house the businesses? those whose health may be affected. And these questions are not new. A century ago, let us remind ourselves, they helped lead to the rise of the labor union movement. More recently, they changed the environmental responsibility of companies. But the pace of change and the nature of our global environment makes the question of corporate responsibility all the more urgent. because never before have corporations had this much power to shape governments, societies, and economics. Even the oil and rail barons of the early 20th century and late 19th century could not change the pipelines of information with the speed and power we see today. But here's where I'd like to make a turn, because when I came out here, any time I come out here, I think more of hope of what can be done to improve life. Hope I've found over a lifetime of reporting and living is contagious, and I think it's good for business. The vast majority of people I've met in my travels are good people, and they want to help others. When I was at CBS News, there was a culture in the news division where those who worked for CBS News felt, by and large, that we were part of something bigger than ourselves, and we were grateful for that. To be sure, there was office politics and fierce competition with the other network news divisions, but there was also hope, a hope that if you did your job right, you would help to inform, educate, and even on occasion entertain, and that what you were doing was work that mattered. The tech company of Silicon Valley draws some of the most brilliant talent from around the world, I think, for some of the same reasons. The business climate here, built around intellectual property, seed investment, and startups, alongside behemoths with almost unbelievable value, it's all had its own challenges and incentives. But I believe there still is a sunny optimism and idealism a belief, a deep belief in Silicon Valley that technology can improve the human condition. What it will take in part to do that is no small amount of self-reflection. There will be change from the outside in the form of new government oversight, shifting consumer demands, but a lot of the hope can come internally. A lot of it already does. So I am hoping and again, gently urge you to find ways to harness that as part of the energy that will drive success. 
Let us remind ourselves that one of the hallmarks of the American experience has been the ability to adapt to change. We haven't been, we are not great at everything. But history shows we have been good. It's one of the hallmarks of being an American, the ability to adapt to change. Our nation is still young by global historical standards, but it has seen tremendous innovation and transformation. It has gone from an agrarian society to a largely urban society. It has seen ethnic, cultural, and other demographic change to its populace to a degree that no other nation in the history of the world has ever seen. Now, a lot of this change has not come easily, especially around race. And today, let's state it clearly, we see powerful forces in our politics resisting change by promising a return to a mythic past, a past that was not fair or just for vast swaths of the population. Silicon Valley can and should stand as a counterexample. Silicon Valley should be a place that shows the promise of science and data and dreaming big. It should be a place that understands its disruptive role and seeks to disrupt that which needs to be disrupted while protecting core values like diversity and truth. I submit to you that Silicon Valley must be a place of hope. The nation turns to you, yes, still turns to you, not just to distract or entertain, but to enlighten and to inform. We are in a year, 2020, where politics is ascendant. As I've written and said often on the platforms you've created, I see a deep danger in our current leadership. I do not consider this to be a strictly political judgment. We can and should debate our tax policies. We can and should debate how we structure health care and our regulatory system. That's the American way. But we shouldn't debate hard facts and truth. We shouldn't look away from corruption. We shouldn't deny the realities of the science of our climate crisis. We have to prioritize something other than cruelty in our immigration system. When we face the truth, a hard truth, when we face the truth that we, we, the people of the United States, we have put children in cages, this drives home the fact that this is a time for a deep gut check about who we are and who we want to be as a people and as a nation and as citizens of the larger world. This valley cannot shrink from the mantle of leadership. Technology is a tool, of course, and the technology you are creating are some of the most powerful tools ever imagined by the human mind. They can and must be harnessed for good, and yes, I believe you are the ones who can do it. I'm near the end of this part of our program. We're going to go to questions and answers in a moment. But I want to leave you, and I hope it'll play, I think it will, with a paraphrase from the quote of the late Edward R. Murrow. Murrow was the founding site of electronic journalism as we know it. He was around for the beginning of the radio age, and they're around again for the beginning of the television age. When television first began being on everybody's mind, it was the technology revolution that everybody talked about. Murrow made the speech of his life, and I want to paraphrase some of it for the modern times and leave it to you to think something about. The paraphrase goes this way. All of this technology can teach, it can illuminate, and yes, it even can inspire, but it can do so only to the extent that humans are determined to use it to those ends. Otherwise, it's nothing but ones and zeros behind a screen. There is a great and perhaps decisive battle to be fought against ignorance, intolerance, 
and indifference. This weapon of the new technologies could be useful. As you go about following through on that, I wish you good luck and Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. He's Dan Rather, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rather. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you can see how people feel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Have a seat, please. please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, my goodness, it's a, it's a privilege. I want to ask you, first of all, um, this. Uh, Mr. Rather, you are 88 years old, and I just want to know, I mean, at, at age 88, sir, you could be doing anything that you would like. You could be out on the beach right now, and instead, you're writing books, you are populating social uh, media feeds that are followed by millions, uh, you're being outspoken, and you're doing this. You're uh, spending your time um, in front of audiences that can that can really matter. So I want to know, uh, where are you getting your motivation? Well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, the first thing is I love to work. For whatever reason, I think it's because I was raised by hardworking people who were struggling to make it in depression. But for whatever reason, I really like to work. And I have a great passion for this work. Uh, I've always loved stories, loved reporting, I love this work, you know, and I recognize, and I know many people who are retired and love to play golf and fish or hunt or whatever they do. But for me, I love to work. I have a passion for this work. And I will confess to you, and I suspect it is a confession, and I hope it's not self-serving, that I think most of us, we want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. You want to think that, you know, in some small, perhaps minuscule, microscopic way, that if you work hard and do right, maybe you can make a difference. And that's part of the mix as well. Thank you. Do you mind talking uh, politics for a bit? Sure. <laughs> Love to talk politics. Okay. Who's going to win the California primary, the Democratic primary? Yeah. Who's going to win? Democratic primary. I have no idea. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no. well, here's the thing. That, you know, I think, on, I think, I hope that on my better days, I may be at least half decent about telling you what has happened or what is happening. When it comes to predicting what's going to happen, I'm not worth a damn. <laughs> that, that, uh, my record clearly shows when it comes to making predictions, political predictions or otherwise, that, you know, that old saying, he who lives by the crystal ball learns to eat a lot of broken glass. <laughs> and, and I have eaten more than my share. I would say as, as, as we start, as we, as we make this turn, I do think uh, that it's open. That sometimes you can, or at least you think you see, well, one person has a clear lead. Uh, and having said that, I'll go as far as to say is that uh, Bernie Sanders has been from the beginning, overall in the main, the best organized, the best financed, and has, is the only one of the candidates who has a very large and sustained group of backers, those who don't like them would call it a cult, but a group of backers, who are what we call in journalism willing to fall on hand grenades for him, really dedicated people. So whether it's the California primary or Wyoming or Delaware, uh, Sanders is going to be a factor. I'm not predicting he will get the nomination, but I do think he'll be around... Uh, competing at or near the finish. But with California, uh, one reason I'm reluctant, I don't want to talk the question to death, is Bloomberg's entry into the race. Yes, what about it? Is clearly calculated yep. on his ability to do extremely well in California. I would say he probably needs to win California to ensure himself for going to the convention as a nominee. Uh, but this, this has been Bloomberg's uh, bet from the beginning. Mm -hmm. California is his big bet. Uh, and I think he's the person to watch, not because I think he would necessarily do especially well or will win, but he's the person to watch for the moment. As a person who's seen a lot of elections and a lot of candidates come and go, are you impressed at all by the rise of Pete Buttigieg? Uh, I am impressed by the rise of, uh, of, 
Mayor Pete, as he prefers to be called, uh, that when he got in the race, quite frankly, my assessment is that he could make it interesting and that he might build his time with a long, but he wasn't likely to do very well in Iowa or New Hampshire, and he's done very well in both. And it would not shock me, it would not surprise me that he winds up with the nomination. I don't think by any stretch of the imagination he'd be said uh, to be the favorite. Uh, his, among his negatives is he's not very well known and so far not particularly well liked uh, in the African-American community, or for that matter, Latin American community. But those things can change, as we've seen in the case of uh, Senator Kopachar. Things can change quickly. One especially effective debate appearance and one rise in one primary can make a big difference. And so it could be with Pete. Broader question. Uh, you've lived a lot of history. You've reported a lot of it from the very front lines. Right now, this moment that we're in feels to us as uh, incredibly divisive, um, broken, and I'm just wondering if you can compare it to other uh, points and moments in our history, comparing it, for example, to the Great Depression or the World War or uh, McCarthyism or Vietnam. What does this feel like in comparison? Well, I really appreciate that, uh, that question, and we could spend the rest of the afternoon talking about it. We don't have that much time, but in direct answer to your question, uh, this is unique unto itself for several reasons, but, and I'll, I may detail a couple of those reasons, but we have to keep in mind that we've been through some really testing times before. Just in my lifetime, the combination of the Great Depression and the great two ocean war against the Axis powers. This was a time, and I think it's very easy for people who were not born at that time or not of memory age. At the beginning of World War II, it not only was, if you pardon the syntax, it was not only uncertain that we could win, it actually looked like we were likely to lose, having to face both the Germans and the Japanese, both of which were very, very organized. But the, the combination of the Great Depression and World War II, extremely difficult time for the country. The 1960s, again, we, those of us who lived through it are a little prone to forget, the country was immensely divided and very polarized and in a state of shock with the assassinations of President John Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, Malcolm X, uh, you know, extremely stressful time. Uh, the Watergate period in which we had a constitutional crisis. So, We've been through really tough times. Now, what makes this unique? There are a number of things that make it unique. First of all, I, I, not in my lifetime, and I don't see a time in American history when we had a, a, a presidency so dedicated to extreme nationalism to the point of favoring authoritarianism. Now, these are very difficult things to say. They're very difficult words to argue, but never before we had anyone who so openly espouses what I consider, and I think by any objective analysis, are deeply authoritarian moves. Now, I'm not saying that this, we're not at a dictatorship, we're not near a dictatorship, but we know the steps that lead. When authoritarian in leaning governments and positions of power begin to preach the gospel of extreme nationalism, that leads very quickly, if you aren't careful, to extreme tribalism. And I think we all know enough, at least from seventh grade civics, to know that if we ever make that descent, if we make the final descent to extreme nationalism resulting in extreme tribalism, then we cannot survive as a constitutional republic based on the principles of freedom and democracy. And that's what makes this time different. Now, people say, well, President Nixon faced, uh, he resigned instead of facing almost certain impeachment, and that's true. What was different with the Nixon impeachment period and the Trump period, the charges against President Nixon, the ones which proved to be true, the ones who resulted in his leaving, is that he, the president, unquestionably, there was no question, it was hard fact, he, the president, had led a widespread conspiracy, a criminal conspiracy, but 
It was domestic. There was not a foreign factor involved in that. This time here in the second decade of the 21st century, the allegations and some of the proven facts are that a foreign, at least one foreign power is involved. That makes it considerably different than the Nixon time. But, you know, overall, I mean, I have people all the time say, listen, we, we've never been through a period as difficult as this. I, I don't, for accuracy, I don't think we can say that. We've been through other times that were perilous and extremely difficult. But this time uh, is, is unique in a number of ways, two of which I've tried to mention. Thank you. We don't have much time left. How about, a, how about one or two questions about journalism, state of journalism? Sure. Um, well, let's start with this one. People have talked about social media as creating these echo chambers and uh, having other effects that have eroded the proper standing and stature of journalism itself. Um, and you are a legendary journalist. But you, sir, have taken to social media, and you now have millions of followers. So what were you thinking? Was it like if you can't beat them, join them? Is that, is that what happened? No, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. Pretty close, maybe, but <laughs> I wouldn't say. No, what happened with me is, quite frankly, uh, that when it was first suggested, when social media first began to, to emerge, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, I said to myself and said to a small staff of people, most of whom are much younger than I am, to myself, I was born too soon for social media. Uh, that I'm sure it's something wonderful and has great potential, but it's not for me. At my age and stage, I'm not taking it on. But the younger people I work with uh, fairly quickly, in effect, came back to me and said, Dan, look, it, it's, not, it's not actually a, uh, an option that if... <laughs> If, if you want to stay relevant, even on the edges, if you want to be relevant, anything close to relevant, it's imperative that you get into social media. Otherwise, go fish, do something. <laughs> uh, so I, I agreed to try it. And in the early going, uh, you know, it was a steep learning curve for me. Uh, for among the things I was, I was told, some things that proved not to be true. For example, I was told, you have to write short. Write one sentence or two sentences. That's about all anybody's going to pay attention to, if you write anything at length. Well, it, had, it turned out it's not my experience, that if you have something to say, uh, it's true. You, you can write in somewhat longer form, and you people, will find, people will find it. Yeah, I'm one of your followers, by the way. Well, so are they. Um, <laughs> uh, not much time left. Tell me this. Is there a liberal bias in the media? The what? Is there a liberal bias in the media? You know, I think this is, uh, first of all, let me acknowledge that I'm probably not in the best position to answer that because I have been, quote, in the media uh, as man and boy for over 70 years. But I do think that uh, this is bullshine. <laughs> and, and, that, <clears throat> and that it is born of people who have their own partisan political and or ideological biases that to bring it down to a personal case, I know, and I'd be really stupid, you can make a case I am, but even more so, if I didn't recognize that over a long period of my career, one of the things that about is one, he's, he's part of the elite. Uh, and, he's, and partly because he's one of the elite, uh, he has these deep and abiding liberal biases. Well, very quickly, uh, you know, I'm the son of, a, of an oil field dish digger who never saw anything but public schools. I'm not playing humble beginnings, but I'm saying, listen, this is not the profile of an elite person who went to Sam Houston State Teachers College, not exactly one of the world's best-known institutions. We like to think of it as the Stanford of East Texas. <laughs> <laughs> But we were perfectly aware a lot of people out here never heard of this damn place. Uh, volunteered for the Marine Corps during war. No, I have one of the shortest and least distinguished records in the whole history of the Marine Corps. But I volunteered and I volunteered during war. This is not the picture of some, as I'm sometimes pictured, Eastern elitist. As far as liberal bias, look, I walked with Dr. Martin Luther King and covered Dr. King day by day, week in, month out, for two years in the early 1960s, 
at a time when CBS was called, quote, the colored broadcasting system by even our own affiliates in the South. Very controversial story. I covered the Vietnam War. Controversial story. I covered Watergate. My point is, when you're, when you're on point as a journalist, covering those kind of controversial stories, there are people who are going to try to place a label on you. And the same is true with any number of inst uh, journalistic institutions and the whole institution of journalism as a whole. I would say that, uh, to, in answer to your question about the liberal bias, what is true is that many reporters, particularly those who were brought up on the old-fashioned repertorial uh, apprentice system, what you do see is the underside, the kind of Dickensian side of society that many people never see. You know what happens at the police station after midnight on Saturday night. Sure. You've been to the emergency room of the charity hospital. You've seen the homeless, the hungry, the heartbroken, the helpless, the voiceless. Um, you're exposed to those things. And there is a natural tendency to want other people to recognize what that world is. And for any number of people and forces, when you do that, they want to put the thing liberal on you. Now, I will say, I do have empathy and compassion for the kind of people and situations we just outlined. And if that makes you a liberal, then liberal I am. Yeah. <laughs> He's Dan Rather. Thank you. I wish we had another hour. I wish we had three hours. <laughs> so do I. I wish we had all day long. Thank, Thank you, you very much. May I? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, he was kind enough to say thank you. I, I don't want to extend the time, but I can't resist telling you another story because, uh, folks, uh, and this won't take long, but it must have been obvious to you that I was having some difficulty hearing up here, even though we're close by, and that I have some difficulty in hearing. You know, there's very little dignity in journalism, particularly in television journalism, and there's no dignity in getting to be 80 years old. But the fact is, I don't hear as well as I once did. That's what this difficulty in hearing here was about. And I lost about 40% of my hearing during the Vietnam War, and age is taking care of the rest. But the late Walter Cronkite, whom I mentioned earlier, uh, he lived well into his 90s. And uh, when he got to be late 80s, early 90s, he had difficulty hearing. And his wife, Betsy, tells the following story. I wouldn't tell this story except that Mrs. Cronkite told it all the time. <laughs> that when Walter was beginning to lose his hearing kind of seriously, they liked to sail. And they were sailing off the coast of Arthur's Vineyard one summer. And uh, Betsy said to Walter, they had guests, we need to go in and get resupplied. So they took the dinghy and went in to Martha's Vineyard to pick up some supplies for the boat. There was a big crowd at the store. And of course, everybody recognized Walter Cronkite and everybody wants to say hello. You know, hello, Walter. I've been listening to you since I was a child. Uh, do you know so-and-so? Have you met so-and-so? And Walter was great handling people, so he stopped and talked to each and every person. And Mrs. Cronkite, she just wants to get the supplies and go to the boat. So it takes a long time, but they finally get up to the cash register, and Mrs. Cronkite is saying to herself, thank God we're finally through this. When one last gentleman kind of came out of the shadows and says to Walter, do you know so-and-so and so-and-so? And, -so? and that Walter, according to Mrs. Cronkite, pulled himself up to his full six feet and said, well, I can't say that I know him, but I have met him, and he's a wonderful fellow. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> they get outside, and Mrs. Cronkite says, Walter, you have to do something with your hearing. That man asks you, do you know Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Dan Rather. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you again. You so much. We're so grateful Thank to you, you Mr. Rather. Thank you.